once you get that one and you stand, I'll open up in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be in the house of God. We thank you, dear Lord, for what you're doing in our midst, what you're doing in our hearts, and what you're doing in the night. Lord, I pray that you continue giving us outreach to those around us. I pray that you make hearts uh, open and tender to the word of God. Help us to be bold and be courageous as we present the gospel that also we'd be loving and kind. That we would not be um, uh, offensive to those around us, but at the same time, that we would not back down from the truth, that we would allow uh, you to use us in any uh, capacity you see fit. Father, we thank you again for what you're doing. We ask now for your blessings today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Number 70, holy, holy, holy.
If you would, take your Bibles and turn back into the book of Judges. We are We're in chapter 18. Um, excuse me, my mind is racing to kick, catch up to try to figure out where I'm at right now. All right, uh, we had uh, been in uh, verse uh, 7, we are moving on to verse 8, but before we do, uh, Brother Robert has mentioned he has some things he would like to be able to present, and so um, I guess I should say teach us, so go ahead, Brother Robert. Thank you very much. I found a map that said that the different uh, places that the Israelites were allotted, and the Danites were not allotted the land that they were trying to take over, that belonged to Manasseh. And if you remember the conversation between Joshua and Manasseh, Manasseh did not want to go into the hill country. So they never did go into the hill country. The, the uh, Sidon, right, Sidon? The Sidon, what? Sidon. 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 Sidon, yeah, thank you. They moved into the very top of the hill country. And that's why they were protected. The trees were never cut down. It was flourishing. It had everything one, one needed. So the Danites basically were operating like the Amalekites, when they took on Ziglag, they were just marauders. The, they, the, they not, the land they were given was 300 miles away from where they're going to end up taking over. So I just wanted to give you a little bit. But oh, the other thing was the Levites were given 48 cities, and part of that was the refugees. The Levites had no business being up there either. <laughs> so everybody yeah. had deserted and had a mind to do their own thing. Um, and, and that is the book of Judges, by the way. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's the whole theme. Uh, it's not that they were following after God. And we see that from the very first chapter as we've gone through. They all did after uh, their own hearts, which is unfortunately, I, I, I kind of think that we live in that time today that every man does that which is, after, is right in his own eyes. It's me too. They got their, their own truth. They got everything is, is according to their thoughts. How unfortunate. It's the will of God. It's His Word that rules or should rule. Matter of fact, let me just say this. It does rule. They just don't realize it yet. Because one day they will stand before Him and they will be judged by Him and they'll realize they may have thought that they control the situation, but they do not. And so now we move on down to verse 8. And it's kind of interesting because he, he kind of clears up some things that I really couldn't answer at the point. I did not uh, go into that type of study. And so... Um, uh, I think it's going to help us um, along the way. So anyway, verse 8 says, And they came unto their brethren to Zorah and to Eshtaol, and their brethren said unto them, What say ye? So who's the they here? They said they came. Who's the they? The five men. Okay. So the five men come unto their brethren. So who would the brethren be? It would be the Danites. Uh, they would be connected in some way, uh, uh, even if they say brethren, like we're brethren, uh, if we're saved. So, that, But the connection here, I think, by context is the Danites, uh, and, and also specifically to these two areas. So in this verse, we find these people not only see uh, what was uh, portrayed in, in verse 7, but they are now carrying back the details of what they have observed. Um, they do not uh, keep these things to themselves. That's not their intention. Their intention is to, to give it to others uh, that they might possibly uh, be able to convince people that are like them. Um, I think sometimes, uh, you know, I was thinking of the word brethren. Uh, the, the, you know, we understand here they were uh, likely of the same tribe, which uh, I'm, you know, I'm not disputing that at all. Um, we also, I would think that they had the same intent these other people, or tendencies, maybe I should say, they, uh, uh, how do I want to say this? When, you, when you're around people that you're like, whether you're a wicked person, whether you're a godly person, you tend to speak more freely than when you're around people you're not like. Uh, they're, they're, you just you have an open heart. My dad always talked about uh, believers having a kindred spirit. You get around a bunch of believers, and there's an ease there where you can converse and talk about the things of God that you really don't have in the world. And so I do see this. I see that they freely give out these details. 
Um, these people are probably uh, right in line with all their thoughts, but not completely. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, do you think the people they're giving de these details and information out to, their brethren are good people? It's just an opinion. Probably about the same. Uh, some of them may be more godly. You know, when you get in the crowd, there are always some who have a better conscience than others about things, a better uh, view of things. Um, but in this instance, I, I have a feeling they're, they're pretty close to the same character. Uh, but I still think, you know, there, there is some various, uh, variations in that. Uh, but in, in th this instance also, we speak of those seeking an inheritance or a possession, if you would. It was very interesting, he, he, had, he had studied and found out that this wasn't really something that, that should fall to their inheritance. So in the process of seeking after, right now, based on what he said and based on what we know about these people, the young Levite and all, we know that they're not really following after God's will. We know they're not following after God's plan or purpose at this point. So we're back in the flesh. Every man did that which right in his own eyes. We wanted inheritance, we wanted now, we wanted our way. And so they move forward with that. Um, in the process of getting this inheritance, it, it appears to me they're going to have to kill some people. And, and, and by what we know, will find out, not what we know, but what we will find out, it doesn't seem they have any reservations about that. Um, they are basically seeking... And let me see if I can word this. They're seeking a materialistic possession of their own. Could I say that and we all be in agreement? So they're willing to steal it by any means from somebody else. Does that ring any bells about our world today? You know, I, 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 we have come in a time. I was just reading about this several days ago. I've read about it a couple months ago as well. Uh, we're, we're coming to a time when people are being allowed by law to go in another person's house and possess it. Police won't come and kick them out. They will not come. They will not help you get them out. Um, and when the homeowners, the legal owners, are prevented by the, the law from even themselves taking the thieves out. This is an amazing time we live in. Y'all have not heard of this? I see people with, with their eyes burnt up. This is happening, and it's happening. It's, it's a lot. It's a big thing right now. Uh, not only with illegal aliens coming in, and I think especially of the states at this point, uh, but also just squatters. People going in and taking something that's for sale. They change, sometimes they change the locks, other times. Uh, and, and usually when, by the time they get them out, they've done thousands of dollars worth of damage with no recourse for the homeowner. That's the day in which we live, by the way. The, the, the mindset was back here too. Men are men. People are people. I don't care what culture, what nation. I don't care what um, color their skin or anything. People are people. And this is the nature of man. And so we see this. Um, uh, People, will, you know, that's, uh, I'll just, when I was young, there were a, a group of people, and um, I can remember them talking about easy pickings. You ever heard that, easy pickings? And what these people would do is at night, they would ride around through subdivisions and places where a lot of houses were, and they'd look for things that was easy to steal. They would look in neighborhoods where they were, maybe this was a, a seasonal place that come up, uh, be around the lake during the summer and go back home or, or maybe come up on weekends and stuff. And so that was how they would go to relax. So these people were always constantly watching to steal. That's what they did. Easy pickings. And, and unfortunately, uh, these type of people are willing to, to target it. doesn't matter who. Whoever they can take from, take their possessions. And I think that's a, another reason we find in the Word of God Lay not up your uh, treasures on earth, but lay them up in heaven, because nobody can steal. The moth can't eat it up, and, and rust won't corrupt it. But we tend to, with our eyes, we see this here. Now, I look, I'm not looking to scare you. I'm just telling you facts, all right? This is the age in which we live. But it's not new to our age. 
There have been times when we've had less of this and probably times more. We just, we just have it now. I don't know how bad it is in Canada, but I know what the States is. I do uh, uh, watch after that. You, you know, when we read this passage, um, and you've got to remember what Brother Robert said, do you see any problems um, with this passage? Do you, does anything jump out to you? Yes, ma'am. Well, I see that they certainly don't consult God on what they're doing at all. You're real close to where I'm going, <laughs> but that's good. They're not consulting God, which ought to tell you something. Who consults God? Children of God. These are the children of God doing this thing. We have Christians today that are doing this. We have pastors that stand in the pulpit that are sleeping with secretaries and, and doing all sorts of ungodly things. You understand what I'm telling you? People are people. Pastors, if you get the wrong pastor, he'll be ungodly. He can fall into sin. You just Christians are not above doing wickedness. All the more so why we need to guard ourselves and be careful. We need to, to guard one another, really. Um, my wife is my best shield. Where I go most of the time, 99% of the time, she's there too. So, you know, she's guarding me. Uh, she's watching over me. And so praise the Lord. You know, we can guard each other with that. So these so-called children of God, these are the ones doing evil to others. They're God's chosen people. Some of those claiming um, to be children, God's children, and refer to then and now, they're, they, they're, they just seek to do uh, what they want at any cost. They don't, they don't care. I listen to people sometimes that claim to be doing good. They're doing this, all these things, and they claim to be Christians. But uh, and, and maybe they are um, uh, doing some good. But let me ask you this: You have a person, and I'm not. It's just an illustration. Uh, you have a person who's uh, who's really has some zeal for the Lord, and he goes out and he witnesses to people. He's he's very abrupt. He's very um, hard. And he's very overly zealous for the Lord. Is he doing good or is he doing bad? If he's being led by the Holy Spirit, he's doing right. Well, you, you've got to go back to the foundation I laid. Yeah, but if he's being abrupt, if he's doing abusive, if he's being overzealous, um, he's pushing on those people, he's treating them in a way when they, that God would not treat them. God never pushes. He's not a butcher. He's a leader, but if he's led by the Spirit, his whole countenance will be different. We, if we used to have pastors that were fire and brimstone, today we would say they're a pushy and we go. Well, that's a worldly definition of that because I believe, I've listened to several uh, when I was very little that was fire and brimstone. And I really, uh, at that age, I didn't understand everything, but I enjoyed their preaching. I was kind of young to know all about it, but I enjoyed their preaching. I don't think there's any... A problem with fire and brimstone. I do think there's a problem when when there's an emotional appeal. If you remember, we're talking about this faith promise. I said I don't want to appeal to your emotions. That's not what I want to appeal to. The emotions is of the flesh. I want to appeal to the spirit of God in you. What does God want you to do through this whole thing? I've told you go and pray and ask what God wants you to do. But there are Christians, and I don't mean to be offensive, but there are Christians that I've known that have been very abusive, that have been very controlling, and claimed that they were moving by the Spirit of God. <laughs> Be very careful. The Word of God is very explicit when it goes to talking about God and His nature and His character. And so you have to go and compare that. Um, any good Christian, any spiritual man, can fall into that once or twice or whatever through their life, occasionally, let's say, through their life, because I don't want to number it. But it won't be his habit. There's a, there's a godliness to him. Can people be overly zealous for the Lord and not sin? Sure. But when you combine all these facts together, then you're getting into a little different situation because the God always leads you. He always gives you enough light to step by step. He does not push you. That's not God. He may come to you and say, yes, sir, go ahead. No, I just... 
I've heard somebody say that in most cases where they've found that a preacher or a pastor has been really harsh on something, it's because there's some, some area of their life that isn't right. Could be. And it, was it the pastor being harsh or was the the Spirit of God moving? Well. Because I've heard preaching before that just tore my heart up. And, it, you know, nobody else was having a problem. I guess I need to repent. This is a general, this is just a, a general mm -hmm. observation. That if somebody was really harsh on a particular issue, it often meant they had another issue. That... I, will, I, will, I will go with this at times. Uh, and I, don't, I try not to pick subjects. To, to preach about. I don't try to uh, uh, steer away from preaching about tithing and different things. I tend to go through book by book because I, I want the Spirit of God to deal with that. But are there times when those sermons are hard? Well, yeah, because I've been in here and when I finish the sermon, you can hear a pin drop. So I knew the Lord was, was using that. But I always pray that I'm not involved in that. I, I, that's why I try to go through uh, book uh, by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, because I don't want it to be me. Can there be? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not, but but I do my best to remove that. I, I hope you notice that. Um, but yeah, you don't. When I get involved, I guarantee I'm gonna mess things up. It's the spirit of God we want involved, and we want Him to to administer the hearts. Where one might take the same sermon and be greatly encouraged, some might take that same sermon. And, and, and be just brought to tears over it because how God's working in the heart. But it's God, not I hope never me. But I do believe we do have uh, those out there that are harmful. And, and I say this, uh, uh, some uh, people play to be Christians and they're not. It's, we have the term wolves in sheep's clothing, right? They, they look like a Christian. They, they act like a Christian. They claim what they're doing is for Christ, but in the end, they're not. It's, it's for self or for other uh, selfish reason or they're emotionally moved or whatever it is. Um, I just, you know, the whole idea there was not everybody is who they claim to be. Some are not uh, physically harmful uh, as far as they're not really uh, trying to do something uh, to hurt you. Uh, but they could, uh, if they're not living in righteousness, still have a harmful effect on you spiritually. Um, So how do we protect ourselves from these things? And in, this is the world we live in. How do we protect ourselves? You have to be in the Word yourself. Number one. Different. Number one thing is to be in the Word. Two. Anybody else? Trusting the Lord. Trusting the Lord. Somebody else said something? Prayer. Prayer? Yeah. So if you're in the book, you're in prayer, and you're trusting the Lord, what are you doing? Building a relationship. That's exactly right. You're building a relationship. And the closer you can walk with God, the easier it'll be, this is not new, the easier it'll be for you to discern um, the good and the bad, the, the wicked and the unwicked, those who are not sincere, uh, sincerely serving God and desiring to be, you understand, they're, they're our protection is our surrender to the Spirit. We say, well, that's, that's a point of weakness. Surrender. Not when it's surrender to the Spirit of God. That's never a weakness. That's the most powerful position you can be in. In the will of God. Surrender to the moving of the Spirit to do what he says. And, and Jonathan uh, mentioned prayer. That is the most powerful tool we have today. And the least used in sincerity and truth. You know, how often do we say, well, you know, I've, I'll catch up with this later, you know, or we just have a quick prayer to get through, or uh, don't even pray at all. Uh, prayer is very, very important, the most powerful tool we have. You, you really, um, we need to be careful in this day of, of, of several things. First, uh, physically, uh, those uh, we allow to be close to us, those we allow in and allow ourselves to be exposed to and to expose our families to. You need to be very careful. Those influences, uh, especially the younger they are, uh, your, your children, uh, the longer you have them, the deeper in brain they get, the harder to get out. And then we have uh, the spiritual side of that. Uh, those people are, 
or that are influencing us, we need to be sure that those people are, are godly people. Those people are, are have the same goals, to walk with God, to, to be as God would have us to be, not invariant, not... Don't allow yourself to be unduly influenced. Um, I'm probably going to say this later, but I'll, I'll just say it now. Uh, usually when I get in, into conversations, um, uh, I used to argue a lot. I love apologetics. I really do. Um, but I've learned that is a useless uh, process when you're trying to lead somebody to Christ or you're trying to leave a positive influence. They remember the arguments, but also when a person argues, they put up that defense, you know. And so now you have to beat down the fence to get to the heart. Well, it's almost impossible to do that because the more you beat, the harder it gets. And if it doesn't harden that gate, it definitely hardens that heart. Um, and some people will say, well, you know, you're, you're probably right. And when they tell you that after that argument, they're doing that to shut you up so they can leave. So you've accomplished nothing. And so I, I don't do that. But what I do do is when, um, when uh, not every time, because some things I'm so set on, but when you come up with things, I'll say, wait a minute. Let me go back, and I'll study through uh, our, our point of contention, what, where we disagree, basically. And, and I'll be sure that what I believe is right according to the Word of God. I can't do anything else with them. Yes, sir? We have a prayer here with integrity. Just Say again. Prayer for integrity. How uh -huh. we live our life is from Psalm 101. I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord. I will sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will, not, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not be to me. A forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off him that hath a high look and a proud heart, will not I suffer? Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Amen. Everything you said was separation. Separate yourself from the wicked. Separate yourself unto God. That's a good one. Um, now I've got to figure out. <laughs> You're fine. It's, it's just it's the time of life. They're getting older and older. So um, so anyway, let's go back to those. The they. They came in unto their brethren. Uh, those searching out the land. Uh, I think these were the leaders. They were the leaders of those in waiting. Um, uh, they were the ones who had the motivation and the courage to go and search out. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because there's nothing wrong with, with us searching out the things of God. But it is wrong when we have the wrong intent, the wrong desire, and the wrong direction to search out the things of the world, not the things of the God. Uh, and, and I think you have to be careful that it's not the searching out that's wrong. It's the direction you're following in searching out that really would get you. I think it's it's... Uh, they're not following after God. They're not wanting to be led by God. They're wanting what they want. Now, where does that want come from? It comes from the flesh. And so you have to be very careful with that. What we were talking about, reading the Bible, praying and trusting God, uh, there's a very important thing that, that Christians need to get a hold of, is learning to desire the things that God desires for you. That's a change of mind and a change of heart. You will not get that change of mind if you're not in the Word of God. You will not get that change of heart without praying and trusting God. You're just not going to get it. That's part of our spiritual growth as we grow in that relation to Him. Now, has God ever failed? No. Has God ever been defeated? No. Has God ever been wrong? No. Don't think He's going to start with you then. <laughs> He's not going to. He's never been. He never will be. Um, You know, it's interesting, 
um, you used one Psalms 151, right? 101. 101. I looked at the first thing I looked at was First Thessalonians 4, um, 9 through 11, and I'm not going to read it all, but it said, uh, it says that, and that you studied to be quiet and to do your own business. You know, what is our business? What did Christ say? I must be about my father's business. That's our business, by the way. The father's business. The world is not ours. It's not. Our inheritance is not here. It's, it's different. Now, will we come back? Sure. sure. But I'm not going to get into that and teach that point at this point. I also went to 2 Timothy 2.15. The Bible tells me to study to show myself approved. Who am I showing myself approved to? Men or God? <laughs> Where does men come in then? And these are, these are some of the things that, that kind of guided, got, guided me. Um, um, arguing rarely leads to a change of my mind. It normally leads to war. Okay, it's a battle that doesn't... The last part of this verse in 8 says, He says, and They came to their brethren to Zor, Zorah and to Eshtalah, Alone, and their brethren uh, say unto them, What say ye? What say ye? What's your opinion? Here's, here's what I'm thinking. These people are presenting some truths of what they've seen. They're presenting their perspective, their side of the argument. I think this is an appeal. Their hearts were already sealed in the direction they wanted to go. They wanted to go back and get this piece of land. But when they come back to their tribe, even though they had a lot of them had the same intent, the same desires, there needed to be some persuasion. Who wants to go into battle and get killed for a piece of land? Who wants to do something and get something? And they're saying, oh man, this is an easy place. These people are secure. It's not going to be a problem. So they're beginning to sell this. Now look at nine. And they said, the, again, the five men said, they said, arise that we may go up against them. For we have seen the land. And behold, it is very good. And are you still? Are you, are you still? Be not slothful to go to enter in, to enter to possess the land. Again, it's convincing. Are you still? Are you still not convinced? Don't, don't be lazy. Don't be slothful. Don't be slow. Let's go. And enter to possess the land. These uh, that search out uh, those people, uh, they had returned. And... Uh, to me, they're instigating a rising up to do what their hearts desired. Um, and again, I still have a great conflict in this matter because I know that um, God had given the people, and according to Brother Robert, he'd given the people land, not necessarily this land. But I still struggle. I, I do believe God has given Israel the land. I do believe they have an inheritance by God's degree. It was theirs. But I struggle with them not being godly. I the struggle with the actions of taking the lives of, of people in this manner. I struggle. I really do. And according to what Robert has told us, they're wrong. They shouldn't have been there to start off with. Which is, it lays credence again. I don't think God was in this. I don't think it was his determination. Um, let's go back to the inheritance and, and these people supposed to be going into the land. Were there people killed for them to inherit the land? What kind of people were they? Evil people. Jericho is a perfect example. And even one of Israel, when he stole the Babylonian garments and the wedge of gold, he was killed. Why? But why was it a curse? It was an idol thrown out. It was an idol, sorry. Gold and garments. <clears throat> what kind of garments do you think wicked people wear? What business does a Christian have to wear the things of the world? You know, there are things that the world wears that we can wear. There, are, there is music in the world that we can listen to. There is. Patriotic music. You know, we sing O Canada. That's not necessarily a Christian song, you know, but it's a patriotic song. There's nothing wrong with that. 
But there is a lot more out there in the world that should not come into our homes and our lives. It should not touch our ears if we can help it. And it definitely has no place in the church. And that includes uh, whether it be music, uh, whether it be books, whether it be uh, uh, garments, uh, 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 excuse me, clothing, thank you. <laughs> or whether, it, you know, statues of some sort. You know, you have these statues... Uh, People say are art, and they're from Italy or Rome. Mm, I wouldn't call it art, all right? Um, a different type of pornography, maybe, that they have or had back then. Uh, no, no, I don't agree with that at all. Um, so, I keep going back, was this the manner in which God desired these men to take the land? Were these people... Uh, they were dispossessing. Were they good people? Was this how uh, God's will should have been done? Or was this just in man's strength alone? And I keep going back to the idea, I think it was in man's strength alone. Uh, but again, uh, without Brother Robert getting into that, there would have been a lot of things that would have left more question in my mind. Um, It seems to, to me in my way of thinking, when he when you go back to this verse here tonight, it says they arise, they said arise. It's almost like it's a motivational uh, move. No, how do we get people to respond motivationally? How do motive? Quick, um, not think about it. Okay, quick decisions, but there the, the that appeal is to what? Emotion. emotion. This is emotional appeal. Arise. Let's get going. Let, you don't want to think it over. You don't want to think them over because when you get to thinking, what kicks in? Logic. And if you got an emotional appeal, um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and just say this. I've, I've been um, uh, watching some news about these protesters, you know, you had the Columbia at uh, Columbia University, Northwestern, um, I forget where they're at, but anyway, they just conceded and give in to their demands. You had SWAT have to go in, um, I think to two right now, and remove people. But anyway, you have these protesters. Um, well, uh, can I just wander around a little while? Um, my mind tells me going, going back to what's written here that you know I am kind of going through and analyzing things according to my mind but my, my mind tells me we can't know for set or certain uh, everything that, that, that I think and, and, and give out uh, and what you think but I, we can know for certain everything that's written in, in the word of God there's no doubt about that um, we have this recorded and so we know that. But after the information received, they said, um, these five men said, arise and we go. It seems to my mind uh, that they're the motivators. They're the ones pushing for the others to do this action. And I find that is true in, in the mentality of people, of humans. Um, uh, most cases, when people rise up, you have all these big things. Whether we're, And I'm, I'm going to mention in the States, whether we're talking about Ferguson or, uh, or whether we're talking about uh, these protesters, a lot of this comes out of one or two people. They're the ones pushing and motivating. And there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with motivating people to do right, but when they're motivating them to do wrong, to be wicked, it's a whole different ball game. And so understanding, the, and I'm not uh, destroying a person motivating, I'm destroying the people that are motivating them to the wrong direction. And it's like a warning. So I've looked at a few of these, these uh, clips and, uh, of them protesting against Israel and other things. And in, the, in these clips, ladies, please forgive me. In most of these clips, it's been woman, women at the forefront. And so I ask myself, why? Why are they the, the face Somebody's stirring them. Somebody is moving them. So you get a woman that's emotional. Who tends to bind to them? More women and men. 
They'll begin to bind with them. They'll, and so they'll, they'll easily get a following. And so you have that happening. And then uh, I got to thinking about this thing more and more as I, I, I reviewed a few clips. And you have these women leading the champs. They're bolstering the emotions of the people. They're touching these people with their emotions. And they're re really directing these groups in protest, right? Now, I began to think about women in, in Palestine and these other countries and how they were in the past. And I did do some research on the internet on this. And here's what I found, because I already knew some of this uh, from past studies, but a lot of countries, even in Jewish times especially, uh, in the biblical times especially, women were more so possessions. You don't understand that. They were possessions. So basically, they were vessels to do the work in man's will. Um, and I know I'll get backlash off of that statement, but that's fine. Um, online, as I studied today, uh, uh, in our day here today, uh, a lot of articles are being written that neutralize that truth. They're couched in words that just bring it right down. And if you're not discerning, you'll miss it. So it's not changed. But the way they're presenting it to us, they present it to us in a way that we are more accepting of it. Sin today is presented to us in a way that's more acceptable. And so we, oh, you know, that doesn't sound so bad. Oh, that's not too bad. Oh, you know, that's a good reason to miss church. You understand? It's presented in a more digestible way. And, and I found that very interesting. So I did a little bit of a research, and, and uh, again, and... Going back to the point that it only takes a few uh, to, to move to these protesters, there are several things I read that was really interesting. First of all, there are always people behind the scenes that do not wish to be uncovered. In, in one of these, uh, uh, there was a terrorist's wife. He was convicted terrorist. His wife was a, uh, is the convicted terrorist, Sami al-Aran. And, and she was hanging out around that Colombian encampment and they actually got pictures of her and show her right before the raid. Apparently she disappeared in time anyway. Um, so the, this uh, terrorist, by the way, is a, um, <laughs> he's been deported, deported. He was a professor. This is what we got teaching kids in college. Um, uh, and and he, she was joining the mob. She's inciting all this. Where did she get, where did she get this? Who's motivating her? I would think he is. That's what I would think. So then I, I kept on reading. And uh, there's also was stated um, from the New York Police Department that they know there's outside agitators among the students in the Columbia University protest. Things are not always as they appear, are they? People that, um, and i give you one more I thought was really interesting. And this was uh, by a journalist or a TV reporter. And he had his, you know, his camera and his microphone. And it was, it was in front of Columbia. And it was uh, just it was in the evening, about dark. And these people were just uh, uh, chanting and carrying on. And so he stopped two young ladies. And he asked them, said, are you here in the protest? Yes, we are. He said, could you tell me uh, what you're protesting about? And she looked like she was very high or, or slightly drunk. And so they're, they're again... Understand alcohol and drugs are in a they stop your inhibitions. So you're willing to join in and do things you wouldn't normally do. But uh, she goes, well, 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 I really don't know. And she turns around and asks her friend. And her friend says, well, we are here to, uh, you know, I really don't know why we came. You understand what I'm telling you? So they question them a little further, and apparently... They were at a, they're, they're not even from Columbia. They're from another university. And they got a note or a call or a text. And, and there's somebody wanted them to come down and help in the protest. And so they transported them down there. <laughs> they don't know what they're protesting. They don't know why they're protesting. But yet they're protesting. You understand what's going on? You can either stand for the right cause or the wrong cause, but you better not use emo emotions to determine. You better use logic. You better think it through. We'll get into that. Um, uh, well, I'm out of time. Uh, we'll get into that later.
So anyway, any questions real quick? All right, we are dismissed.